Welcome to the Investor Shed Podcast with Nick Beveridge, the ultimate source for all things investing and beyond. For free tools, tips, and tricks, go to NorthIdahoREI.com. Today's guest features Jimmy Derringer. Jimmy is a realtor, real estate investor, land developer, contractor, and much more. They talk about Jimmy's roots, first deal, local mailers, and going from zero to 15 units in just one month. Stay tuned. All right, Jimmy. Um, you know, for the longest time, I wanted to call your last name D Ringer. If you were telling anybody, you would call it D Ringer. Yeah. Derringer. <laughs> Derringer. Yeah. Okay, I've still been saying it wrong. I thought it was like Dillinger. <laughs> Dillinger. <laughs> but I guess there's no L. Yeah, no L. You can yeah. make an R sound like an L if you want to, but you'd be misspelling yeah. it. Derringer. Yeah. Now, do you go by Jimmy or James or Jimmy? Jimmy. So I go by Jimmy Derringer, yeah. James is too professional. I tried James when I first got into real estate. Yeah, don't do like, that. I was like, no, this is... Everyone loves a Jimmy. This is, yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of Jimmys. There's a lot of James, but... Yeah, that's somebody likes James. Yeah. Sorry, James. James is too boring. I'll agree with that. Sorry to all the two James ever going to listen to this in the future. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Until it blows up and you get like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, man. So... We got you here because you are a real estate investor, you're a realtor, and you're getting into land development. Yep. Uh, tell me, what's your background? When did you first get interested in real estate? Yeah, so I guess I've always had the plan of buying houses and doing real estate. Just wasn't really sure how to get started. Um, I went to school for construction management because it was just like an easy degree, make my parents happy and do something. Oh, to, really? To get okay, so you went to school for construction? Yep. All I've okay. done my whole house, my whole life is just build houses. So really, um, not as like the general, but just like the general laborer who's just swinging a hammer, gets paid ten bucks an hour, kind of. Thing. That's okay. That's but, a good way to start off. But right? you learn a lot of stuff, <laughs> and you learn what you don't want to do is that full time because it's so yeah. difficult. So, went to school for construction management, um, graduated, got a job as a commercial project manager in Minneapolis for a it's uh, a super, I guess, quickly growing company. Um, they started it like two years before I got there. And they went from like zero to like millions real quick. And it was just commercial project management for like the U of L, University of Minnesota, um, building some casinos, and mm -hmm. just like they kept getting bigger and bigger as I was there. So my first project was managing. <laughs> we literally had to cut a hole in a CMU wall uh -huh. for a garage door company, and it was like I don't know what the number was. It was an outrageous amount of money to like just cut a hole, literally in a, in a load bearing like CMU wall. And I was okay. like, damn, commercial is like way more expensive than residential. It'd be nice to go this route. Yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah. So I moved back to Idaho after working there for six months. So you, do you, did you grow up in Idaho then? Yeah. So you moved back? Okay. Yep. So born and raised in Idaho. Right on. What part? Moscow, Idaho. Moscow. Spent All 18 right. years there. Um, got bored, moved to Brazil to study abroad. Oh, geez. For eight months. And then to University of Minnesota. Wait, how old are you? After that. I'm 28. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just look young. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're 17. Thank no, I'm you. just kidding. <laughs> it's a compliment. No, not a bad thing. I look like I'm 14 still. 14, yeah. Actually, I keep saying How, how old are you? Uh, 34. Yeah, you look super yeah. young too. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, you studied abroad. What was Brazil like? Amazing. Yeah. Um, it was kind of an excuse to just travel. We, uh -huh. had, we had class like... Uh, like twice every other week. So it'd be like on Tuesday and Wednesday, we'd have like a week off. So we'd just like go travel, go to the beach. And like the next Tuesday, one day we'd go to class. We'd be like, oh, sorry, we're in Rio de Janeiro this week. We can't make it to class. Um, nice. And it was amazing. So it was just an excuse to travel, I think. Brazilians are fun. Yeah, my wife is Brazilian. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you meet her there? No, we no. met two years ago when I was in LA. Okay. Just hanging out there for a while. And uh, yeah, Brazil, like, it's the best. Like, the culture is amazing. It's so much fun. People are so relaxed there. They are. And the people here are all, like, uptight and they're all working all the time. No, they're so relaxed. <laughs> yeah. I got to, uh, I got the pleasure of working with some Brazilians when I worked at Disney World in Florida. Um, we had this, like, student um, program where the college kids get to come from other countries and work for a summer. Nice. Um, so we had, all and different parts of Brazil. I didn't realize until I worked there that Brazil had, like, a cold area and a warm area. Right, right. <laughs> so we had like some white Brazilian people and some darker Brazilian people, and they they were still like had the same kind of culture. Right. They're just relaxed, really cool people. But it was interesting to see. Oh, this guy's from like like it's like the Idaho of Brazil. <laughs> yeah, like way down south. <laughs> way is down where south. It's cold. Yeah, opposite yeah. of the U.S. because up here north is yep. cold. 
Yeah, and their summers are really the winters and that kind of well in in a certain part of Brazil. Yeah, it's really cool to kind of learn um, how the curvature of the Earth worked back then because I never paid attention during high school. <laughs> yeah, right, and when you're flying down too, you like lose a full day. So like, if it gets dark in the summer here at mm-hmm. 9 p.m. and you go down to the south, like it gets dark at 5 p.m. down there. So yeah. you like you just lose the full day of travel. But it was cold when I was there. Uh, it didn't snow, but it was like 40 degrees. It was. It was a little chilly. Oh, yeah. A little nippy. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what what did you do when you got back? So when I got back, then I decided to go to the University of Minnesota for school. Okay. And that's where I got the construction management degree because it was an easy thing to get a degree in since I knew it. Did um, that degree help you much? I say no, but it's one of those things where, like, you subconsciously, like, just know things and you think you've always have known them. But I probably learned during school. Okay. Um, just random things. Yeah. But I had the choice of... Well, I guess I didn't really have a choice. My parents kind of like, you're going to school. You're going to go this way. But if I wouldn't have gone to school, I would have just started buying houses. And that would okay. have been in 2011. So if I would have started buying houses in 2011, like I was doing a couple years ago, like, would I be retired now? I don't know. The, yeah. Like, just focus all on that rather than paying money to get student loans. You know what I mean? Right. So. Yeah. Well, do you think you'd really be t- retired once you hit a certain point, or do you think you'd I think just retired keep going? is like a general yeah. word. <laughs> like retirement. <laughs> <Have> the ability. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like not having yeah. to go to work or, or whatever, whatever it is, or being able to do bigger things because yeah. you want to rather than because you have to. Okay, that's retirement. So, what did your very first real estate investment look like? When did when did you get started? How old were you? So after I. Um, Left that job as a commercial project manager in Minnesota. I moved to Coeur d'Alene mm-hmm. for, I was only here for like four months. But at that time, even in 2015 or 2016, it was too expensive for me to buy in Coeur d'Alene still because I was working for my friend who had his construction company. But I wasn't like, I was making 15 bucks an hour and a bank wouldn't lend on a $300,000 house for someone yeah. making like 30 grand a year. <laughs> so I was like, crap, where can I buy a house? And what, what kind of work were you doing? Um, just construction. Labor? Yep. So he had work. a general contractor okay. company and we were just like helping helping people or like helping friends do small projects around their house. So like nothing really big. Okay. We, we ran into an issue. We wouldn't, we weren't able to like convince older people to let us remodel their kitchen because they're not going to trust a bunch of like 22 or 23 year old kids to remodel their whole kitchen for right. 30 grand or whatever it is. So I was like, dang, if I go to Spokane, I could buy a house and then we can remodel it ourselves so it was harder for me to find someone to convince me to like (laughs) remodel their house than it was for me just to go buy a house yeah so um i had the construction experience with my buddy and uh i ended up just i guess you got to think like you either like what do you not have when you want to get started in real estate like you don't have a deal you don't have money but like if you have construction experience you can buy a house to remodel so find a deal and then find someone with money to fund it um, so literally just like bought uh, a printer, paper, and like some envelopes yeah. with like literally all the money I had, like 500 <laughs> bucks, <laughs> just like going to Target and like buy a printer. Yeah. And I just started sending direct mail, like, hey, I'm a local investor, I'll buy your house. Okay. Do you want to so sell you went directly to the seller? Direct to seller. Okay. I've only bought one on market, which ended up kind of, in theory, being my best deal. Yeah. Weird how that works, looking back on it, but... Yeah, so the first one I got was a duplex in West Central for, I think we paid like 40 grand for it. Wow. It was super cheap. Okay. And Good area, bad area? It was a bad area at the time. Okay. But Kendall Yards was just being built. So, yeah. like, the neighborhood gentrified super quickly. So we picked that up, got it rented, um, and actually had uh, David... I don't know if he wants to use his full name, but David Pumpkins, we'll call him on this one. <laughs> I think we both yeah. know David Pumpkins. Yeah, um, everyone knows David Pumpkins. <laughs> yeah, so he was my partner on the first one that I got. Okay, and so did he help you fund it then? He had really good relationship with money. Okay. So I brought in the deal. Mr. Pumpkins was like, hey, I got this guy who wants to fund it over here. So we yep. got in together on that. And I was like, damn, this worked out well. Okay. So I kept writing letters. And So did, did you want to work on that house? Yeah, so initially... I wanted to grab the hammer and just like do the construction myself. Yeah. But I picked up like another triplex and a fourplex and like a 10 unit at the time. And I was like, damn, I can't do this myself. Like, I can't remodel all these units at the same time. So I had to. So wait, back up. Hold on. Okay. You, you talk a little too fast sometimes. Sorry, my bad. 
just two seconds ago, you said you bought two more properties? Yeah. So and they were how many units each? So there was a triplex. Okay. Um, a four. See, it was a package deal. So oh, it was, it was a package deal. The duplex, okay. the duplex was here. The and I explain was, a package deal. Same seller had all the properties. Same seller. And they wanted to sell all of them. Okay. So it was the duplex. They had the same triplex. And then there was a 10 unit that they had also. It was four houses on one property. Wow. And then... That's a lot. There was another, I think it was a fourplex that we and, picked up. And how many months were you into buying your first deal? Uh, I had no clue what I was doing. I was into it like a month. A month. Literally no idea. So let's count up the units here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you, yeah, that's right. Within the first month, you go from zero to duplex, triplex. triplex. That's five. So 15. 15. 15 units. Plus, yeah. The units came very quickly. All because beginning. old people wouldn't let you remodel your kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> their yeah, kitchens. Yeah, pretty much. Because it was easier to That's do good. that That's funny. than it was to do construction. Yeah. You know what? You know what's funny? I, I can relate a little bit. Not not on the construction end, but like as being a realtor. I've been a realtor for going on 11 years now. Yeah. And um, for for a good few years, the first few years, um, I you know I look very young. Even though I have experience, I know what I'm That's doing. Like it was very it shadows, was very so. hard to convince people to let me list their homes so I just got frustrated and I'm like I'm just gonna fix and flip my own home so I can list them <laughs> right and make your own condition. and that's what I did and yeah. um and that's it, it was it was more than just that but I it's just kind of funny how that relates I think where I couldn't convince people to actually let me list their homes so I just I'm just gonna go out there and buy homes so I can put them on the market <laughs> 100% I think it like as yeah. an entrepreneur like we're resourceful and we know what's not working mm -hmm. and we're like what's the easiest path to something that works <clears throat> and just like doing it yourself all the time is the easiest way to do it yeah that's funny okay so how did this all turn out go ahead and take your time telling the story <clears throat> so because it's very interesting yeah so there's a lot of moving parts here so um, so you get I, the first I grabbed a hammer and I started just like remodeling myself okay and I was like Damn. no no other help with you well at the time no okay so I was like hey buddy uh, called up a friend like hey buddy I need help painting a door and mm -hmm. he's like okay sounds good so we like we he painted this door with paint that like it didn't have prime we didn't prime it first so we just painted it and he painted the same door like five times. I felt so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it, like, it kept bleeding through every single time. Like you would see like oh, the wood gosh. stains coming through the door. And my, I was like, my brother and I did that on our first <laughs> flip. It wasn't a door, but it was a cabinets, kitchen cabinets. Yeah. Um, we didn't know what we were doing either. We didn't know what primer was. We didn't know anything about construction. We right. didn't learn everything from YouTube. But yeah, right. I remember we painted the kitchen cabinets several times like more than five times and it just kept bleeding through and and just you couldn't yeah the paint would just run off <laughs> yeah. and we're just like what is going on yeah it's so frustrating <laughs> but like with the construction management degree they didn't teach us the small things like yeah they told us like how to manage people and like how to stage people but when you're doing it yourself there's a lot of shit you don't know so you have to like you just got to google it and yeah. figure out online so you figured out primer eventually eventually figured out primer yep after uh, too many coats of paint on the door. <laughs> and uh, so David ended up having another project and he had, he had like, uh, he hired a crew to clean it all out just to like do a demo trip. Yep. And through that, David gave me this lady's number. Um, and I was like, hey, I need help remodeling like 15 units. <laughs> do you guys have any time? And she's like, yeah, we can make something work. So she had a couple sons and a couple sons' friends who were just like unskilled laborers. Uh -huh. So we kind of taught them, everything was multifamily, so all their models were like, um, we're not putting marble in a multifamily, it was like carpet paint, like yeah. next unit. Like carpet paint, fix the trim, next unit. So we kind of had them just like. So it was all cosmetic stuff, all nothing, cosmetic. nothing big. You're not rewiring or replumbing anything? Nothing, no. We okay. could, I, I, we had the opportunity to replumb, but I was like, you have to think like, can you get a tenant in there to pay rent now, or do you need to like replumb all of it first? And the answer is usually like, you can put a tenant in there. Yeah. Like it's it's a nice place to live. There's some stuff the tenant's not going to know about in the basement that could be fixed, but get it making money first. Yep. So they kind of just like snowballed all the units, and in the meantime, I just kept sending letters out, and people kept calling me like, hey, I'm ready to like sell my place. So I'd be like, David, hey, let's buy this one too. And at that time, David was like, we don't have enough cash to like get all these. We got to like figure something else out. So David's like, yeah. let's have. Did he use the same funding source to get the all the other 15? Same like brokerage. Units? Yeah. Okay. 
And they like they helped me. Like I would not and have been able to. How did they structure the down. loan? Did they just fund the whole deal? Um, yes. And all the construction. The or? first, the first one, the first deals we had were very little out of pocket, if any. So most of it was no money down. A couple of yeah. I'm trying to think here. Yeah, most of the stuff I I've done in the beginning was no money down, and they would fund construction, or some construction, and they're yeah. actually to pay cash for construction. And were these homes that you're going to flip? So or keep as rentals. I only did multifamily because I, after listening to like the Bigger Pockets podcast in like 2012, um, back when like Joshua Dorkin was actually on it. Yeah. They'd be like, cash flow is the way to go. Like buy and hold. So the goal was to just buy and hold a bunch of units, and um, like retire off the cash flow. Yeah. So the goal was to buy and hold, but that's not what happened. So that's yeah. <laughs> It's okay. It's funny how things change. Can you share what happened? <laughs> well, I mean, someone put a cash offer in. Oh, okay. And I was like, like this isn't going to make money. Um, well, I guess to take a step back, like we got those remodeled. Um, they were relatively turnkey. Um, there was 15 units, and like I joke, we replaced like 16 water heaters that year. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, how do you replace more water heaters than units? But like, there was like one more thing that would just like keep adding up. So yeah. like you'd think you'd be cash flowing and yep. you'd be like, oh, I forgot. There's a roof leak now. Yeah. You just got to like fix one more thing. So they were all pretty much rented, I think. We had a property manager doing it. And then we had a couple of them refinanced on long-term debt. And so and how'd you get the refi on the long-term? We just had it for more than six months. So six-month seasoning. It was a yeah. commercial lender. But with B, So I know a lot of people... Or running the challenge of not being able to be financeable when they just get into this if they don't have any other side work or, you know, employment. <clears throat> um, were you able to just partner with somebody that got the loan? So we were lucky because... Um, or is it a portfolio thing? It was a portfolio thing. We had enough units so fast, and we had them all on... Um, I think we had them for more than six months on all the residential. Okay. So we ended up putting, like four of our residential like duplexes to fourplexes on a portfolio loan and then that 10 unit that we picked up that was a pain in the ass to fund okay because it was four houses on one property and i wanted to do like lot line adjustments or like separate them by the house yeah but we couldn't get the minimum lot coverage to work and we, i probably looking back on it i probably could have got a variance to make it work mm -hmm. and been able to put it on his own property to make like nice clean duplexes or fourplexes um, but that one, our hard money loan was coming due after like 18 months. Okay. And we're like, well, we can't refinance. Were you cash flowing even with the hard money or was it? We were about breaking difficult? even. Okay. Because the numbers were so good on the property. It's like they're, <clears throat> they weren't expensive properties. So like, yeah, the 40 grand for a duplex. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like the rough numbers. That, so it'd be like a thousand dollars. They were better than the 2% rule, I guess is what you could say. Okay. On all the properties that we bought. They were all better than 2% rule. But that doesn't matter when you're putting in a new water heater every month. Can we, for the people that, that just kind of blew past their heads, a 2% rule? So. You, could you explain that? So like if you pay $100,000 for a house, the 1% rule would be it rents for a thousand dollars so the monthly rent is one percent of the purchase price so okay. for a two percent rule if you buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars two percent would be two thousand dollars per month right so in my scenario 24 I 24 grand a year ish which is almost a 25 percent return with the two percent if you're if you're paying a hundred grand yeah in my mind i just think a one percent rule property on a normal property is like a six cap yeah, okay. A 2% two, a 2 is like a 12 cap okay. ish. It changes based on the properties, but those are like real rough numbers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we paid 40 grand and it should have brought in maybe a thousand. It might have even been a 3% property. It should have brought in 1,500 probably because it was a one, one bed up, two bed down. Yeah. And then the 10 unit was kind of all effed up. Like, <laughs> that was a hard one with like studio apartments, two bed here. Um, okay, it just, wasn't very consistent. It was, it was craziness, yeah. Yeah. If I was a lender, I wouldn't want to lend on it either. Did you ever get it refinanced? No, we ended up selling it. You ended up selling it. Okay, so yeah. hard money loan just remained until you sold it. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, when, <clears throat> I guess, I don't know. 
ask. I'm gonna. I keep rambling if you want, or if that's you okay. Well, tell, so can, can you share some of the numbers? You okay um, with that, or do you want to avoid that? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's tough. I don't know. Or did you forget? <laughs> so. Yeah, I forgot because we've. I think I've done too many. That, like they all blur together. It's funny. I'll look back okay. on, on like the Spokane County Assessor website and be like, "How much did I pay for this one? Or, like, what yeah. I wholesale this one for?" It's like wholesale. Yeah, you forget like, sometimes. Yeah. When time goes by. But in general, uh, so if somebody, and the reason I ask, I just want, for the people out there that want to get into this and like about, you know, what could they expect to pay for something like that and how much did you end up selling it for? Did you sell it off market? So some Or did you put it on the market? Some of it was on market. Some of it was off market. Um, numbers back five years ago don't relate at all to numbers today. Right. Um, but we sold, like, so the duplex we bought for... 40 ish we probably sold that for 150 ish but we put in work to it like a lot of work um if you had to guess how much money and repairs did you put into that um, duplex 25 30 okay so you did pretty good that's not counting my labor either okay because i did a good amount on the on the beginning stuff until i phased myself out yeah um so yeah all of it we did a good amount like we we had good profits on it Mm-hmm. But looking at what the hard money lenders made, it's like I made a third, Mr. Pumpkins made a third, and then the hard money lender made a third. And I'm like, damn, they didn't do anything. Yeah. So it's like, how do you get out of the hard money lender game? So if we if we could take a step back again, um, what would be what would be like that seller's reasoning for wanting to sell everything at a discount? There were a lot of squatters and just like dangerous things okay so you had a lot of problems to take care of yeah mostly tenant problems it needed a lot of work how'd you deal with squatters you just hire your property manager to take care of it um we had some crazy contractors that kind of just like boarded up doors and okay just like they kind of handled it the contractors (laughs) handled it and then they just kind of like the squatters like didn't come back it's like the okay on the triplex that we got there were like knives stuck in the wall and just like crazy things written all over, like F you, if you come in here, you're gonna die. Things like that. Okay. Like the, yeah, weird stuff that if I was so the that seller. That seller was just like, just get me out of here. Yeah, they, were, <laughs> they inherited it from a family member, I think was the full story. Okay, and, so they didn't have much skin in the game anyway. And they just wanted they some just cash. Inherited they it. didn't want to like manage tenants. And yeah, we like, <laughs> I remember we walked out of one of the units one day and there was a pipe bomb on the stairs. And I was like, all right, no one touch this. We're going to call the cops. We're going to get it out of here. Yeah. I walked away and I walked back and one of my subs like threw it in the garbage can himself. I'm like, you don't grab a pipe bomb. And throw it. (laughs) And throw it in a garbage can. (laughs) Like you leave that for someone else to deal with. But Hmm. the people I worked with were like, they were, they were super good, uh, but a little bit, uh, I guess, new or crazy. I'm not sure what the word would be. Laborers. Laborers, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) They they didn't hit F. Yeah. It's usually not like a, some. I've had great laborers work with us, and some that like they're just barely hanging on. <laughs> yeah, um, but they've got skills and they need cash. Super trustworthy. Like some I'd give them, them the keys trust- to like the house that I would live in because I had a duplex that I would live in one unit. And oh, okay. I had the other unit out. And one I of the just, one of the properties that you bought um, you were living at. Yeah, I actually got bank financing on that one. I ended up being able to get a. That was the only market deal I ever bought in my life. Okay. Did you keep that one or did you sell that too? I sold that one too. I have nothing right now. I sold okay. everything in Spokane. Gotcha. And you guys did well. Yeah. Parted ways. Um, or do you still work? I, I still talk to them all the time. We haven't partnered on a deal since those beginning ones. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I still would partner with them. Everything okay. worked out great. Right on. Yeah. So what came after after your Spokane adventure? So after Spokane, um, the coronavirus happened, I guess. That's the next phase. Okay. I picked up a commercial building, and I was going to put my office in it. And the coronavirus hit as I was, like, trying to lease it out to tenants and, like, do some remodeling. And I was like, I don't want to carry a coronavi- uh, commercial I, building. How'd you, how'd you buy a commercial building same thing it was seller financing seller financing yeah okay and then i just did all the work on was this a letter that you sent out or yeah, everything okay. was direct mail that direct done. direct to seller and got a building yep, cool exactly um, that's awesome i was super stoked about it it was like this cool brick building i was gonna remodel it and make like a coffee shop and do all oh, this nice. and that um ended up just realizing like i needed someone to pay the bills and then the coronavirus hit yep and it was like i don't want to carry this giant open like warehouse space 
when no one's in buying Washington space in during Washington. COVID. Exactly. So I was like, okay, let's part ways with this. So got rid of that one. How long did it take you to get rid of it? Um, a couple months. So not very long for commercial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but then... Did you break even? Did no, you make I lost, a profit? I lost a good amount of money on that one. A good amount. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the only deal I lost money on. Um, okay. And it happened right during the coronavirus. Yeah. So I just moved away from that one. Um, so, but you got it on seller financing. So did you re, did you work a deal, give it back to the seller, yeah, so sell, he, sold it back or so something like that? he took it back, yeah. Okay. So I, I did some improvements. Um, not a, I guess not enough to make it, to improve the value that much. I was sitting on it, like kind of like a long-term play. Yeah. And then coronavirus hits. So I'm like, I'm, I'm straight short-term. Like, I'm going to survive this coronavirus. God, I, I find it so interesting and so unfortunate as well that just like the people involved in like real estate and buildings and that kind of stuff here in the North Idaho region, their businesses just exploded. Yes. Yes. They've gone um, crazy. Versus uh, there's a lot of people I know in the Spokane that were doing a lot of great business, yep. big players, and just got shut down. And it just... It just boggles my mind what a difference five minutes can make over the state line. <laughs> Seriously, like restaurants in Post Falls, like their business has skyrocketed. Yeah, but they can't. They in can't Spokane, keep up. like everything has gone downhill. Yeah, but I'm guilty of that. Like I live in the valley, so I drive from the valley to Post Falls to like restaurants just because yeah. I want to go to a restaurant. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> give them my money. Yeah, a lot of Washington plates lately. It's funny. I went. You know where Triple Play is? Yeah, I took my kids to Triple Play a couple weeks ago. And um, we could not get a parking spot. There are cars everywhere on the side of the roads and like yeah. in the bushes and stuff like that. And I, the parking lot's big. And I drove around with the kids and I just wanted, I'm like, I'm going to count the Idaho plates. Yeah. <laughs> Counted four. Yep. Four Idaho plates in the entire parking lot. And there were hundreds. <laughs> of Washington? <laughs> of Washington. And California. You walk, yeah. You walk in. You walk into this triple play. It's like a kids theme park kind of thing with bowling alleys and all and kinds of activities and, and arcades and water park. Yeah. Um, and, and you're just elbow to elbow in there. With the, the place is just packed. Yep. Extremely packed. And it was just, we just had to go. It was too hot. No masks. Not many people wear masks. Yeah. No. The, the mask mandate got lifted here um, in Kootenai County recently. And, um, you don't have to wear masks in many many places anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so different because then in the valley, everywhere you go, you have to wear a mask still. Yeah, I see people wearing masks just walking around outside. Yeah, or, or in their car like, by themselves. Or their car by themselves. I, have, I see I see that quite a bit. I have a lot of questions <laughs> about the whole like coronavirus thing. I don't think we'll ever get answers to it, but oh well, no. just keep living like. <laughs> it just is what it keep is. Keep life going. Yeah. 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 We're not going to change anything. Yeah, <laughs> I, for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> just move on. Yeah. Let the professionals do what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Just, just yeah, do what you can. Just keep life as normal as possible, and then like. It's just interesting what a, and then you look at the statistics of like death rates, between like this county and other counties that are like heavily restricted, and you're just like there's no difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like sometimes you walk around and, Coon County area, and it's like COVID doesn't even exist here. Right. <laughs> Right. Um, it's, yeah, and people have different viewpoints on it, too. Like, um, I was talking to someone, like, ah, the coronavirus isn't that big of a deal. Like, I understand it's, like, it's a bad virus. Yeah. But it's not like it's fake. Right. But at the same time. <laughs> is it time, blown out of proportion a little bit? <laughs> yeah, it's a bad virus. But is it that bad? And then she was like, well, uh, my, I think it was, like, my, my boyfriend's grandma died from it or something like that. And I was like, oh, well. I guess when you know someone directly affected, it totally changes your opinion. Yeah. Just one, like knowing one person affected changes everything. Yeah. Notice how she said grandma. Yeah. 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 Old, older people are affected more by it. Yeah. She could have died that year anyway. That's true. Yeah. We're, we're going to stop talking about COVID now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just, That's going to get some bad. hate. I know. You can hate me. I don't care anymore <laughs> yeah and it, it's funny how like policies affect things like yeah washington totally shut down yep. and then i think it made me in the beginning i was trying to make predictions like when coronavirus first happened my buddy called me he's like hey we're gonna have a lockdown you're gonna need to have a pass to drive on the freeway to go anywhere like this isn't like this is serious you can't do anything for two weeks and um 
I was like, it sounds weird, but okay. So my prediction was like the world's going to shut down for like six months, like totally, totally shut down. Yeah. Um, and it was like a week and a half of shutdown. And then it like slowly started opening up again. At least in Idaho, it was kind of like that. It was weird. Yeah. When it first happened, everybody around here, I think took it pretty darn seriously. Yeah. And, um, I remember I, I even turned like right as within that couple of week period of a shutdown, I had an opportunity to jump on a, uh, house flip and post falls. I would have netted like 130 grand. Yeah. And I turned it down. Yes. Same such situation a dump, over I probably here. could have made more than that, but like it was, it was just a, such an unquestionable, like you felt, you felt like it was, okay, we're at the peak of the market and this is what's going to turn things around. Yes. Um, but who could have predicted what actually happened was that state policies could have drove people out. Yeah. <laughs> I, and and into areas like ours. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that statement. Like, it's going to turn things around. I was sitting in my room like, okay, the crash is about to happen. I was like, they wound up a trebuchet and they're getting ready just like the fire shit all over the place. Yeah. And it never happened. Like, it just started going up and up and up. Yeah. And the crash, I, I don't think it's even here yet with all the money that's just been thrown into the system. Yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen for sure. Who knows when. Could happen a month from now. <laughs> but True. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Have you noticed a slowdown being an agent? Have you noticed a slowdown in the market at all lately? Um, I know there are less sellers out there and a thousand times more buyers. That's the only thing. A slowdown in terms of less inventory, yeah. But like buyer demand, no. Not with you? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Not. I think we've definitely in the last month or so, we've noticed a, quite a shift. Buyer demand? Um, buyer demand. Well, so many buyers have just been priced out. Yeah. I think when, when we had uh, earlier in the year, a lot of, you know, average price points of homes were like in the mid to higher 300s. Mm -hmm. And then they would get 20 offers. Right. Um, and some people would offer as high as, you know, 425 or something like the 75 grand over list price. Yeah. Now all of a sudden that became the new standard. But the funny thing was you had a bunch of people that were interested in paying 350, 375. Mm -hmm. And they were never going to pay four twenty five, but you had a couple of desperate people that did. Mm -hmm. And now those couple, you have few desperate people. They got their homes, and now the market's been lifted to four twenty five, yes. four fifty, <laughs> and there's just way less buyers because people can't afford it anymore. And you had the crazy outliers that you know drove the market up to this point, and they're done, <laughs> almost. Yeah, to a certain extent, that's that's what I've noticed. And now you have these a bunch of overpriced properties, and nobody can afford them except yeah. for just a few people. So they get way less activity, way less offers. I can totally see that with single but you families. Have, but you have the proof to show, hey, this is where our pricing's at. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's, it's gone up and now it's like leveling. It might drop a little bit maybe. I think it will. Um, I've been dealing only but with... But I've been wrong. Right, yeah. Again and again and again and again. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've been dealing only with multifamilies. So mm -hmm. multifamily is like... <clears throat> yeah, there's like it, no inventory. It's, it's like the hottest thing that people can buy, especially if you're coming from Seattle, because you're selling stuff at the top of the market in Seattle, buying yeah. things in Spokane, the 1031 exchange. You don't care necessarily if it's cash flowing, you just don't want to pay taxes and you just want to like, you know, build some Spokane equity, I guess. Yeah. Things here are so much cheaper than there. Which is just so interesting to see a duplex being listed for seven, 900 grand around here when you're like, no, that. even with our crazy rents, it's not gonna cash flow. And oh. Some people are buying it just to throw their money somewhere else because the US dollar is worth so little now. 100%, or, yeah. And they just wanna shield their money. I, and I thought the same thing, like like three years ago when I sold off my multifamily properties, like yeah. cash investors from Seattle were buying them. And I was like, these guys aren't gonna cash flow, what are they doing? And they're like, oh, stupid Spokane guys selling discounted properties. And they've probably gained like 50% in equity. Yeah like even in the last three years buying them. And now today we're like, eh, prices aren't gonna like drop. They're gonna like maybe level off. They might still go up another 30%. Yeah. It's so hard to make that prediction. Yeah, the last couple of houses that we sold up in Dover um, in the $600,000 price point, both buyers that we had were people buying them as investments. $600,000 single family rental. Right. Not short term, because you can do short term in that neighborhood. They're just going to be long term rentals. Um, and, and they're both people from diff different people out of state just putting their money in something else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's super interesting yeah. to see that. It's that funny you, how like a good deal is relative. 
yeah. to like your to current situation, in the country. what's going on in the country. Like if you were going to get started in real estate, like, and you wanted to retire in like retire in five years, I wouldn't recommend buying a six hundred thousand dollar house in Dover. Like you're going to want to build some equity doing something. But if you're like wanting to put your money in a safe place and you're coming from a place where you have some more cash that you're sitting on, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like everybody's like it. It's better than just letting the cash sit in the bank. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or getting taxed, getting taxed on and losing value due to inflation. And if inflation is as crazy as people say it is, and yeah, I think it has been. I mean, lumber alone has gone up like four hundred percent in the last like four years. It's gone up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. it's not just lumber. I even went to buy, I bought a paintbrush and it was double the price when it was like even a year and a half ago. Just like a normal Home Depot. Yeah. $10 paintbrush. Used to be $5, now it's 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I was a kid, (laughs) prices were way different. Yeah. And you can blame it on whatever, but I mean, it's, I think that the big elephant in the room that people don't really pay attention to anymore is just the printing press. Right. You know, when you print out trillions of dollars a year it's going to create um a lesser value dollar <laughs> that's not going to be able to buy as much 100 percent. and people never talk about that yeah it's always about oh gosh this is so expensive i'm blaming it on this why are people tr- paying uh, charging this now <laughs> <laughs> yeah well trillion dollars were just printed last month <laughs> right that dilutes the money <laughs> right and then you can get into like the consumer price index and mm-hmm. like oh it's only inflation's only going to be one point five percent, but like, based on the consumer price index, which like, they just pick and choose their products, so it might actually be fifteen percent. But if they're only choosing certain things to keep the number low, you're not going to know the real inflation. But like looking around on everyday things, like even restaurant prices are going up because they have to go up to survive. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. And it's not one point five percent. It's like ten percent at least. It, meal prices. Oh gosh, it could be quite a bit. I remember just. I remember just a couple of months ago going to Sweeto Burrito and buying an $8 burrito. That same burrito is now $12. Yeah. Just a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, the old McDonald's dollar menu, they changed it to the value menu. It was a while ago. But, right. But still, like, yeah. it's no longer, like, you can't buy something for a dollar anymore. You know who I really fear so for? Huh. The Dollar Tree. Oh, the t- they might have changed their name. They're going to have to change it to the three dollar tree or something (laughs) yeah where everything's just gonna have to be cut in half the the bitcoin tree yeah sorry we're going off topic maybe but it all relates yeah Yeah. it's all business it's all real estate so so what are you what kind of real estate projects are you working on today so i am working on land specifically in idaho i've committed a hundred percent away from multifamily in spokane washington um I ended up just getting some listings to like keep paying the bills after the last like from January till now. So I just sold 10 duplexes to fourplexes in Washington. And now it's just 100% direct to seller in Idaho. Um, Actually, one of the relationships that I built from the Spokane multifamily was a guy who has he he claimed he subdivided or developed 3% of Spokane County. And uh-huh. I was like, this guy's full of shit. Like, he doesn't know what the <laughs> fuck he's talking about. Um, and I ended up meeting with him since I sent him a letter, like, hey, I want to buy your duplex when you're ready to sell. He's like, I don't want to sell, but I want to talk to you about something else. Hmm. And he met with me and he showed me his old, like, maps of Spokane County. And they're, like, outlined in red. So he's like, I did this, I did this, I did this. So, like, a lot of the big projects around, like, the rural areas of Spokane County, he's, like, divided and either built houses or, like, had a, a home builder build houses. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> he's like, this is what you should be doing, not like multifamily. And I was like, okay, sounds good. So I kind of trusted him on that. And I just like backed off multifamily, focused on Idaho and started going direct to seller for development, which is kind of the end goal. That's that interesting. So how, how old would you say this guy was? 65, 70. 65, so, 70. Wow. So okay. We're, so we're partnering on some stuff in Idaho right now. So we had a guest speaker at our REI club um, maybe a year and a half ago or so. Yeah. Older gentleman, very successful, very wealthy. Um, he was in his 70s, I think. Yeah. 
Um, and he, one of the biggest keys of advice he gave us was, okay, so you got a city, right? People like the city. If it's a grow, growing city, it might be a good thing to invest in, but don't, don't invest in the city. He's like, oh, just outside of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> invest in the more rural areas surrounding the city that are less, lesser priced, hold on to them. Yes. Um, and they will be worth a lot more in decades down the road. <laughs> and that was some killer advice. Right. I thought. You know, for a guy that has so much experience, and he had tons and tons and tons of knowledge, and that was the biggest takeaway was don't focus right, you know, where all the action is. Go out just outside the action and let it come to you. <laughs> right. Do what other people aren't doing is kind mm-hmm. of what that is. If you can sit on the land for 50 years, like, great idea. But if you can't sit on it, uh, that's kind of tough to make a $100,000 investment make sense 50 years down the road. Right. Yeah, you got to be able to sit. <laughs> yeah have the cash make a um, cash flow somehow so what so what's your plan so <clears throat> or what have you so I'm working with a couple of builders right now mm-hmm. the partner that I have has seen the market crash like three times and he's like it's gonna crash but yep. just don't be holding on to anything you can't support like through a downturn so he's like let's let's get some properties turn and burn some properties and then the stuff you have free and clear just build on it Okay. And that's kind of my plan right now. I have building my, spec homes or keep or rentals? I want to build rentals. So okay. single family rentals, probably do Airbnbs. On acreage? Uh, on acreage. Wow. Yeah. And the Airbnb, I like Airbnb. I haven't done an Airbnb yet, but I've heard the numbers are really good. Yeah. Um, and it seems like whenever you deal with someone who's on vacation, like you kind of bring up the vacation like brings out the best in people. Yeah. So if they're on vacation, like generally they're good to work with. Um, they, I mean, they pay obviously more for their single family house they're going to rent than a long term tenant would. But you're going to have like the, I guess the maintenance pro- maintenance problems with that, that comes with Airbnbs or cleaning and all the expenses. It's a customer service that. job versus a passive right investment job, and that's why I've noticed the difference between my investments with my long-term rentals and the Airbnb that I've had. And you're keeping your Airbnbs, right? You haven't turned them into long-terms? Um, I would have I, sh- I would have converted it into a long-term, but I ended up selling one, mm. uh, my main one, um, to be able to buy some land in, in Bonner County as well that <laughs> nice. I'm sitting on now. Nice. <laughs> um, but I, I did notice, I, I, I ran the numbers, um, and I, I probably would have made five grand more if uh, if I kept it as an Airbnb or, or if I would have. Yeah. Okay. Annually on this one property mm-hmm. that we did pretty well on, and it was it was um, occupied most of the year. Nice. And but uh, w- some things I just never really factored were, I until I got into it. You're paying the heating bill, you're paying the a- internet bill. Right. Um. You're you're paying all all so all the utilities, and you're also running down there to supply. The paper towels and the toilet paper during the pandemic. Right. And Good luck um, finding that. You know, this particular property was um, that I had as a cabin um, up kind of in the woods, but in the city. It was a really cool setup. Yeah. Um, but there would be wildlife there, bears. <laughs> Dang. And people get scared and they call you in the middle of the night. And <laughs> they call they you, you about to bears? Come. Yep. Well, so a long term tenant probably wouldn't call their landlord if they had, you know, a bear on their porch. Right. But a guest would. <laughs> did you actually field that phone call and talk to him? Oh yeah. How did yeah. that? What did they uh, say? I came by. Oh, I I drove by that morning and gave him some bear spray and came by with my <laughs> shotgun and just say, you know, this is just the way things are. Just well, what they had, they had their trash laid out outside. Oh, they wanted to see some bears. They didn't know any better. No. They they didn't know you should. <laughs> You should tie up your garbage and put it in the shed. So we, we have better instructions for the next client. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Don't just leave bears. the trash outside because it will attract animals. <laughs> yeah. So did you leave so bear spray on the property after that? Yeah. Bear yeah, bears. there's bear spray, like, hanging up with the headlamps and stuff with people that want to go hiking. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's necessary but, up here. But there's I, – I have other investments where I hadn't heard a peep in five years, and I get a, a deposit every month. Mm-hmm. Um this particular cabin was very focus intense. Like, hmm. you have to constantly coordinate cleaners. Constantly, there, there's your. It's it's a different business that constantly needs looked after. Um, just to make an extra few hundred a month hmm. um, wasn't my cup of tea. Just because I can make so much more money focusing on other things. Yeah. Now, if my business was all, if I had more time, 
I'd probably get more into it and convert everything to Airbnbs because then I can just have a system where, hey, I'm in the Airbnb business and this is what I do. Yep. But just having one of those and a bunch of long-term and then other projects going on, that Airbnb, for me, it just didn't make sense to keep it because just because it made an extra few thousand dollars a year, it was, uh, I, I make uh, I make more doing other things right. than paying attention to something like that. 100%. I totally get yeah. that. Yeah. I'm ready to build the Airbnb system out. That's yeah. kind of what I'm working towards. If it doesn't work, then at least I have some cheap debt real estate. Yeah. Like worst case scenario is you just have a nice house. I would just I would be cautious and run your numbers to make sure that they work as long term rentals as well. Yeah. 100%. In case in case that business model doesn't work for you, because some people make the mistake of they run a deal and make and only make it make sense as an Airbnb, but if you know <clears throat> pandemic hits or something like that, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden there's no guest anymore. Right. <laughs> Can you fill it long term and still make your mortgage payment and all your other expenses and may still be profitable? Right. It's like if you're going to buy a hundred unit building, like don't run it based on like student rents. Like yeah, do it based on a normal hundred unit building in the area, and then like student rentals rentals are like icing on the cake. Like if you go per bedroom, it's just more money coming in. Yeah. But yeah, don't plan on that because <laughs> that could go wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, how's it going so far? Have you have you um, you've already made offers on a bunch of different stuff, right? And you have things in the pipeline. Yep. So I have a bunch of stuff in the pipeline. Two accepted offers right now. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna be working on some subdivisions. Um, I guess bring the utilities in, bring the road in, make some like really nice lots yeah. in northern Idaho. <clears throat> Probably sell off the lots, the stuff that we don't have debt on. I have a contractor lined up to start building houses. Okay. I mean, he probably can't do more than like one or two a year. So trying to look to how do we build houses fast enough with like, how do you find labor? I guess is the question because labor doesn't <laughs> exist in Northern Idaho. There's subs, subs, <laughs> subs don't exist. It's like really hard because everyone's so busy because ah. they're making so much money on other stuff. Yeah, talk to more people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, so, yeah. So like I, I have a couple of Spokane guys coming to work on some Idaho projects. Okay. Um, and they're super on board for that. But uh, yeah, just subdividing of some land, selling off the po- uh, parcels to get the money back after we put the expenses into it. Um, and then just building homes is kind of the, the name awesome. of the game. So to retract your strategy is so you're buying land on acreage. Yep. You're going to subdivide and sell off most of it to be able to pay for the build and the Airbnb of the one, you know, piece of property. Yep. That you're going to keep. That's, pay that's for pretty it. brilliant. Pay for it until we either have it like free and clear and then go to a bank uh-huh. or just use cash to build on so it. So you'll be in a really good position on that property with plenty of equity. <clears throat> yes. Nice. Yeah. That's um, a good plan. The issue is it's really hard <laughs> to find things that meet that criteria Yeah. because everybody wants to come to Idaho. So, like, so land's very expensive. Very, very expensive. Yeah. And people are... Getting it too, a lady shot me an email. She had like 20 acres, really nice property. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah, I want no less than 4 million. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, this doesn't make sense. But it was like a really nice, like equestrian or like a, like a horse yeah. stable property. And if someone wanted a nice, like horse themed property in Idaho, like it's a really good deal. Um, was it coming, waterfront or anything? It had a river that went by it. So oh, okay. relatively close to water. Um, but if someone came from like LA, they could afford it, and that would be like their Idaho lifestyle. But for here, someone like like us from Idaho, we're like, what? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, I used to go for four bucks ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, way cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Land prices have skyrocketed. We just listed some land recently that we had to try to figure out a way to make sense of the money that the seller wanted for it. Um, but it was a duplex and a single wide on ten acres in Blanchard. Seven seventy five. Yeah, I seven, saw that one come seven fifty. Seven fifty. <laughs> Do we price at seven seventy five? I think we were seven fifty. Seven something. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what? It could it could make sense to somebody if they subdivided half of it, built their house, and then they raise the rents on the three units, and then it's bringing in three grand a month. Yeah. And so if they are all in at a million bucks with their house build, at least it's bringing in three grand a month. It could subsidize a big chunk of that mortgage. Yeah, it's so, unique, but it still makes sense. Yeah, you just have to you just have to play around. You got to be creative. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're paying anywhere else three hundred grand 
for a five acre undeveloped piece of property. <laughs> right, yeah, bring in your own utilities. Like, yep. hope you get easements, good luck. Yeah. That's kind of what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what else is in the horizon? You just gonna focus on that or do you got any other projects you're working on? I'm totally, yeah, totally moved out of Spokane, totally moved out of multifamily for the time being until mm -hmm. things get a little more normal. And uh, yeah, just 100% Idaho, building Airbnb properties. And I keep trying to pass you some stuff, but you're all clapped out on your your building. We just got to we got to sit down and talk. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, my days are definitely short. These <laughs> like yeah, not a lot of time left. But um, I'm working on uh, I'm trying to find a project manager that makes sense. Right. To to offload a lot of the what I got going on it will definitely help. But my goal is to build a building company. Mm. Um, and I, I feel like we're just a couple of pieces away for making it make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to be managing the construction yourself? or mm, No, I want the right manager to be managing that construction. So I just want to manage the business. So you just bring projects to, for the manager to, pro to manage, and he subs it all out, and you just keep like feeding him yep. through your pipe. Nice. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, you know, that's kind of what we had on a very small scale with the house flipping business. I brought in the deals. My brother tackled it. And we split it 50-50, and it worked out well. Yeah. But now there's 17 projects with a mix of new construction and a lot. Of, there's just right. too much too much going on for me. I just need the right project manager. Yeah. <laughs> Which I've been interviewing people lately. I feel like we're pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Higher, higher slow, fire fast? Yeah. Is that the term? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really taking my time on this one. <laughs> yeah. Especially if yeah. you feed him with so many projects, like that's a lot of responsibility. Oh yeah, a lot of oversight from you on him, making sure things go right for the, for the. Yeah, future. and there's got to be the right incentive. I mean, it has to pay super well, and there's got to be some profit sharing involved in my head, at least. Um, and so this person has to be super competent, and right. have construction knowledge and QuickBooks knowledge, and yeah, <laughs> and be able to be organized. Yeah drive a truck around yeah that kind of stuff you need to hire a robot <laughs> yeah I need a robot i need <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Just kidding. awesome anything else we want to talk about uh, that's pretty much all i got going on right now what kind of advice do you have for the people that just don't know how to get started um what do you have any general advice that you would give to yeah i think at listeners? a really basic term think about what you're good at or what you have and think about what you need so like when i got started mm -hmm. i was relatively good at construction, yeah. Um, but I needed a deal and I needed money. So like, I found a deal and I found money or someone with access to money and put it together. Um, so, you, so. so you needed to figure out what you didn't have. Exactly. And, um, and figure out what you needed. So like, and if, then just go after those. If you're sitting on millions <laughs> in Seattle, like, you're gonna need probably a good realtor to buy some market deals. Because if you don't wanna like, buy super risky properties, just buy nice, 1980 duplex for like 400 grand in Spokane. It makes sense in your position. Yeah. But if you're brand new, you can't do that. No. Yeah. Any more $40,000 duplexes <laughs> in the Spokane Ask market? Ask me in 10 years. <laughs> I'll, I'll, You'd I'll, think they'd be going down with all the, you know, the moratorium and stuff, but you know. <clears throat> when, when the coronavirus first hit, I was getting calls from previous leads saying, hey, ready to sell. Mm -hmm. um, but even then I was like, no, I'll take a step back. No, thanks. <laughs> Don't want to buy anything now. Yeah. Um, but who knows? In five years, you might get some 40,000 duplexes again. Things can change fast. Yep. All right, cool. Well, let's wrap it up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem. Thanks for tuning in to the Investor Shed Podcast. If you'd like to attend our live networking events, they're held the first Thursday of every month at the Keller Williams office in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and start at 6.30 p.m. We also have our Sandpoint, Idaho meetup held at Laughing Dog Brewery the second Thursday of every month at 6 p.m.